गुड मॉर्निंग एवरी वन टीम गेस्ट रिस्पेक्टेड डिग्नेटरीज साइंटिस्ट फैकल्टी स्टूडेंट स्टाफ लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन ए वॉम वेलकम टू द फाउंडेशन डे ऑफ आई सी आर नेशनल इंस्टीट्यूट फॉर प्लांट बायोटेक्नोलॉजी और एन आई पी बी एस बी फाउंडी कॉलेज आई एम डॉक्टर शबाना एंड इट्स माई प्लेजर टू बी योर होस्ट फॉर दिस स्पेशल ओकेजन टू कमेंस द प्रोग्राम I request the dignitaries to please grace the dais. Dr. Sanjay Kumar, Chairman, Agricultural Scientist Recruitment Board (ASRB), Professor Shantanu Bhattacharya, Director, Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research (Tirupati), Dr. R. P. Sharma, former Director, NIPB, Dr. T. R. Sharma, Deputy Director General, Crop Science (ICAR). Dr. D. K. Adava, Assistant Director General, Seeds (ICAR). Dr. T. Mahapatra, Chairperson, PPV (FRA). Dr. R. C. Bhattacharya, Director, NIPB. thank you sir our institute nipb is one of the premier research institution of the indian council of agricultural research today we are proud to be have completed 39 glorious years of splendid with achievements since our first inception as the biotechnology center of the indian agricultural research institute for molecular biology and biotechnology research in crop plants while we continue our journey to pursue excellence as has always been our legacy today is a day, day indeed a day of celebration to inaugurate this program let us proceed with the lighting of the lamp symbolizing the dispelling of darkness and the illumination of knowledge followed by offering the floral tribute to the late professor v l chopra former director and founder of nipb to express our deepest gratitude for his immense contribution in conceiving and nurturing nipb what it is today i request all the dignitaries on the dais to please do the honors
I request uh, Mrs. Uh, Vishali, the daughter of V. L. Chopra, sir. Thank you, sir. Following this, uh, let us invoke the blessing of Ma Saraswati, the embodiment of knowledge, music, and art. I request uh, our NIPB student Shreya Das, Kalyani, and Shravani to present the Saraswati Vandana. Shravani Kalyani and Shreya, may Ma Saraswati bless our institute and take it to the heights of the sky. Now, I would like to request our director and IPB, Dr. R.C. Bhattacharya, to welcome our dignitaries with a bouquet as a token of our deep respect and appreciation. Firstly, let us welcome Dr. Sanjay Kumar, the chairman of the Agricultural Scientist Recruitment Board, our esteemed chief guest for today. A warm welcome to Professor Shantanu Bhattacharya, a director of uh, uh, Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research, Tirupati. A special welcome to Dr. R.P. Sharma, our former director. We also extend a warm welcome to Dr. T. R. Sharma, Deputy Director General, Crop Science ICR. We welcome Dr. D. K. Yadav, sir, Assistant Director General. Uh, see, uh, <laughs> now I, I would like to request. Uh, 
Uh, we welcome Dr. T. Mahapatra, Chairperson PPVFRA. And now we welcome Dr. D. K. Adav, sir, Assistant Director General, Seats ICR. We are truly honored to have all, uh, all you with us today on this special occasion, the Foundation Day of ICR and IPB. Your presence adds immense value to the celebration of our achievements and milestones. Now, it's my honor to welcome and invite the Director of ICR and IPB, Dr. R.C. Bhattacharya, to deliver the welcome address. A very good morning to each one of you and all. I welcome you all to this Foundation Day program of ICR NIPB. I am humbled that you all have spared your valuable time to be here at our Institute's Foundation Day, even such a cold winter. At the outset, I would like to pay my tributes to late Professor B.L. Chopra, a recipient of Padma Bhushan, Member Planning Commission, Secretary Dare, and Director General ICR, and Head of the Division of Biotechnology of IARI. He was the brilliant brain behind the establishment of this institute way back in 1985, which went on to become an independent institute as NRCPB, National Research Center on Plant Biotechnology, and then subsequently was given the full-fledged institute status as National Institute for Plant Biotechnology. This is a day of grand celebration as on this day, 38 years ago, this institute was born. Moreover, it brings back the sweet memories of Sir Professor B. L. Chopra and reminiscence of my days with him always remain as a source of inspiration. I also take pride in being his doctoral student. It is indeed my pleasure and from the core of my heart, I welcome Professor R.P. Sarma, my teacher and the first director of this institute. Sir has been a source of wisdom. His persistent striving for perfection encouraged us to do more and more. His passion for science is infectious. I must say that Today, we are also celebrating the golden jubilee of Professor R. P. Sarma's glorious work on the wingless mutant of Drosophila. <laughs> Such fundamental and significant discoveries need to be celebrated with aplomb, and they always inspire us to do much more quality research in this institute. It is a pleasure for us and indeed an honor for the institute to have Professor Santanu Bhattacharya Director IISER Tirupati. Professor Santanu Bhattacharya did his PhD from Rajar University and had a postdoctoral stint with Professor Hargobind Khurada, a Nobel laureate at MIT USA. He was at the prestigious Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, and has taken the present position only last year. With profound reverence, I welcome you, sir. It is my proud privilege to welcome Dr. Sanjay Kumar, Chairman ASRB. He did his master's and PhD degrees from G.B. Pant University of Agriculture and, and Technology, where I did my master's in molecular biology and biotechnology. So I feel proud that I share the common alma mater, and we are so happy to have you with us on such a joyous occasion. Your presence is inspiring and motivational to all of us. Thank you, sir. I welcome Dr. Trilochan Mahapatra, who is always, we treat his as our family member. Sir has been constant source of guidance, not only on these days, but way back when we were all students. And his immense contribution has built up this institution with a role of founder member. I would be really sort of words to welcome my beloved Dr. T. R. Sarma, Deputy Director General Crop Science, Indian Council of Agricultural Research, 
Sir had been at NIPB for nearly two decades and served as, as its director before moving to Nabi Mohali and then to the present position. Sir, I am delighted to have you with us. I fondly remember the Foundation Day that you organized in 2015 with Professor G. Padmanavan as the chief guest. You have been a mentor of this institute and we all look to your guidance and direction for the betterment of this institute. Your presence means a lot to all of us and we are grateful for your esteemed presence. I extend my personal welcome to Dr. D.K. Jadava, ADG Seeds, Indian Council of Agricultural Research, who is always there to support and guide us. I have a long association with him, for we happen to work on the golden crop brassica. And now I take his advice on many of the official matters. Thank you very much, sir, that you found time to grace this occasion. I heartily welcome Vaisali, as her presence in this program is very, very special to us. I see in the audience several uh, of my seniors, eminent personalities, starting from one end, Dr. Padadia, Dr. Brahmanan, Dr. Uh, Vishwanathan, uh, my senior and our colleague, Professor N.K. Singh, uh, my teacher, Dr. Kaundal, uh, Honorable uh, Professor Sopuri, Dr. Anil Grover, Dr. Saran, so many, and I beg your pardon, Dr. Srinivasan, Dr. Mandal, Dr. Renu, Dr. Rai, so many, and I beg your pardon that I will fall short of time if I try to take name of each of you. I also welcome the heads of the divisions and professors and the other dignitaries from the headquarters who could find time to at attend and grace this occasion. I also welcome all my colleagues, seniors who have joined online to this Foundation Day program. I take this opportunity to welcome all my scientific, technical and administrative staff at NIPB. I see a lot of students, both UG and PG in the audience, who are indeed our strength and pride. I also started my journey at NIPB as a PhD student way back in 1994 under the guidance of Professor B. L. Chopra. I welcome all the project personnel, YPs, JRFs, SRFs, research associates, and all others who are present in this hall and who are indeed the backbone of research work that is being carried out at NIPB. Once again, I warmly welcome you all and I look forward for further proceedings of this program. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for setting the tone for this momentous occasion. Now let us hear some valuable insights from someone who has been an integral part of this institution's journey. Please join me in welcoming Deputy Director General, Crop Science, Indian Council of Agricultural Research, Dr. T. R. Sharma, sir, for his remarks. Very good morning to all. Honorable Chief Guest of the Day, Dr. Sanjay Kumar, Chairman ASRB, Dr. T. Mahapatra, former DG ICR and Chairman PBPFRA, Professor Santanu Bhattacharya, Director. Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research, Tirupati, and the speaker of the day, Dr. D.K. Yadav, my colleague and ADG seed from the council, Dr. R.C. Bhattacharya, director and IPV, most respected professor R.P. Sharpa, former director and IPV, and I can see galaxy of scientists in the audiences. Professor Sudhir Sopori, Vice Chancellor, former Vice Chancellor of JNU and Chairman of RAC and IPV. Dr. K.R. Condal, 
former director NIPV, Professor N.K. Singh, national professor NIPV, Dr. C. Nivashan, former director NIPV, Professor An Anil Grover, professor, former professor, Delhi University South Campus, Dr. Viswanathan, joint director, IARI, Dr. Padaria, joint director, extension, NIPV. We have our special guest with us, Mrs. Vaishali, daughter of Professor B. L. Chopra, distinguished head of the department of IARI, staff and student of NIPV, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to extend my heartiest congratulations to all of you on this very important occasion of the National Institute on Plant Biotechnology, that is the Foundation Day, which we started celebrating a few years back. And when we started Foundation Day lecture, the very first Foundation Day was to be delivered by Professor V. L. Chopra, and he, in, in fact, came here, but because of his ill health, we could not organize that lecture on that day. I remember that Dr. Bhattacharya and Dr. S.R. Bhatt, both of them went to hospital with Professor V. L. Chopra. He came here to deliver his talk. But today I am happy to note that this lecture, which we started in 2015, is being named on the name of Professor V. L. Chopra Foundation Day Lecture. So my appreciation to the director and the staff of National Institute on Plant Biotechnology for recognizing the contribution of a distinguished personality who was instrumental in establishing not only Biotechnology Center at IRI New Delhi, but also guiding the biotechnological research in the country. Well, friend, National Institute of Plant Biotechnology has kept pace with the advancement of sciences in the past. Starting from a very modest technique of plant tissue culture in the 90s, it has developed mustard variety Pusa Jai Kisan using tissue culture and soma clonal variation, which was the variety, first variety or product of tissue culture developed by Professor V. L. Chopra at this institute. In terms of bringing genes from wild species to the cultivated one, this institute has successfully used somatic hybridization in brassica species and developed Mauricandia based cytoplasmic male sterile system, which is being used extensively in the hybrid development in various programs of the country by public and private funded institutions. In the era of transgenics, National Institute of Plant Biotechnology was instrumental in developing many genes, gene constructs and promoters and shared those with different institutions and private companies. And not only that, even institute has successfully developed transgenic pigeon pea which is at various stages of testing. When we worked on plant genomics, which was started way back in 2000, NIPV successfully decoded genomes of rice along with Delhi University South Campus in 2005, and which was followed subsequently by sequencing more than genomes of more than dozens of species and all genomic resources are made available to the public for use in developing DNA markers and mapping genes and QDNs. Using functional and comparative genomics approaches, many landmark discoveries were made at this center in the mapping, cloning, and characterization of useful genes and QTLs of different traits. And although genes and QTLs are now being introduced in different varieties in, of many crops, 
in the country. Human resource development is one of the very important component of molecular biology and biotechnology and as told by Dr. Bhattacharya, this institute was instrumental in extensively training students at master's and PhD as well as at postdoctorate level in the area of molecular biology and biotechnology in the past and continuing these efforts in future in developing a very strong human resource in the areas of agricultural biotechnology in the country. If we see in future, we have a new technology, genome editing, which has now been used extensively in the improvement of crop plants, although technique was given way back in 2010 and 12. And I am happy to inform everybody here that more than 20 crore rupees has already been sanctioned to NIPV to work on genome editing by utilizing various genes of different crops and then modifying those genes by using this very important and innovative method. And I am looking forward various products which will come from using this particular approach from this institute and I am sure that like Pusa Jaiksan we would be having many more products which will come by using genome editing approach in different crops. Similarly, a new program in the country which was started after long discussion with Dr. Mahapatra when he was uh, DGICAR on AICRP on biotech crop and responsibility of this particular program is also given to NIPV and I am sure that the institute will definitely help in testing and evaluating various biotech product of public and private funded institutions in the country. Well friends, the institute is known for its contribution in various high class publications, patents, products and also partnership in various with various organizations and also with various companies and I am sure that in coming years the institute will definitely devote its efforts on developing these products and will help in growing agriculture research in different areas and different crops in the country. My best wishes to all of you, to all the students, the staff and also to the director on this very important occasion of Foundation Day of Indian Institute of Plant Biotechnology. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir, for your insightful remarks. Now, it's my honor to invite our own Dr. P. Mahapatra, sir, chairperson PPVFRA, for his valuable remarks. Thank you very much. Uh, very good morning to everybody and heartiest congratulations to everyone from the institute who are present here on this occasion of Foundation Day. Um, always uh, uh, it is uh, uh, good to remember uh, the founders who uh, spent their lifetime uh, to establish, nurture and uh, uh, many ways uh, um, continue to nurture, in fact, uh, this institution or for that matter any institution. And today uh, we are uh, going to have this uh, lecture which is now named in the name of Professor V.L. Chopra. So um, uh, dignitaries on the dais, dignitaries off the dais, colleagues, friends, students, uh, it's my privilege and pleasure to be here. On several occasions in the past, I have uh, come to the center and uh, spoke uh, about many things. I am not going to really uh, spend time on the dais. In fact, I was supposed to be there in the audience. In the last moment it was changed. So, uh, but thanks uh, Director Dr. Bhattacharya 
for giving me this opportunity. Uh, uh, very importantly, what we have today is uh, uh, not only respecting and uh, uh, remembering Professor V. L. Chopra, uh, who established this center. Uh, and uh, uh, truly, uh, we owe everything for the existence of the center. And for that matter, the biotech research in the whole Indian Council of Agriculture Research. And uh, I know of Professor B. L. Chopra's efforts in those days, uh, immediately after the International Genetics Congress. Uh, that was uh, something which is, which is remembered every time we talk of uh, plant biotechnology in the ICR system. And more so for this institution. So good that, uh, you know, we have named this lecture uh, in his name and uh, 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 we will be uh, remembering him forever uh, through this uh, lecture uh, over years. Uh, so thanks uh, to Dr. Bhattacharya and colleagues uh, for uh, this initiative. And the second teacher, uh, Professor R.P. Sharma, who is on the dais, uh, and we are going to felicitate him for his remarkable contribution uh, with regard to discovery of the wingless mutant. In fact, uh, not only discovery, he induced it. So it was a kind of uh, uh, innovation uh, which, was, uh, which is unparalleled because the kind of uh, homology one finds, uh, you know, with the wingless uh, in case of human system, and that is uh, the wind chain and the signaling pathway involved in cancer development. Uh, the whole lot of work and uh, uh, some time back in December uh, we had uh, a presentation from Drasupla and celebrating 50 years of wingless mutant here in this very hall. And uh, Professor Lakhotia, Professor Shashidhar talking about uh, Drasupla development and particularly highlighting how important the wingless has been globally. So we had uh, that kind of teachers who taught us. I have been students of both. And today, Professor R.P. Sarma being here. It's a proud moment, sir. And uh, we are uh, here to celebrate that 50 years of English mutant. And more so, as Dr. Bhattacharya said, that uh, teachers like him who continue to inspire, uh, you know, not only us, uh, who have uh, spent a lifetime and uh, out of, uh, uh, in fact, uh, service, but uh, a new generation of students. Uh, so uh, uh, the kind of determination, kind of perseverance, uh, all that that you represent uh, and continue to represent. Uh, even uh, when we were actually working on generation of mutants in rice, that was his idea that why we should not really go ahead with uh, uh, you know, functional analysis of rice genes after uh, genome sequencing of rice, uh, that to utilizing conventional uh, chemical mutagenesis. And, uh, you know, when we were writing this project, uh, you know, uh, that was his idea, but, uh, you know, we implemented this with the support of DBT. And several mutants have been generated, uh, you know, not just he stopped with the Drosophila mutation, continued the inducing mutation in other crops as well, and the last one. And I'm highlighting this because, uh, you know, uh, he used to be in the field for several hours in the hot sun, despite his age, you know, late, uh, you know, 70s and early 80s. And he will be standing there to guide us, uh, uh, you know, and then helping us identify mutants. And uh, you all know that one of the mutant uh, is herbicide tolerant mutant, uh, which is being, which has been already used and transferred to several backgrounds by Dr. A. K. Singh and his colleagues. Uh, so, so that's the kind of teacher, uh, teachers we had, uh, who not only established institutions, nurtured them, but also, uh, you know, uh, uh, built uh, careers of several people and guided, nurtured several human resources valuable human resources in this country. So we are grateful to you, sir, for being here. And thanks to Dr. Bhattacharya for, uh, you know, thinking about it and again 
having felicitation as part, part of this Foundation Day program. Other teachers are there, Professor Kondal, Professor Sopari, uh, Professor Srinivasan, those who have taught us and uh, guided us and continue to inspire us. So it's a uh, you know, wonderful day uh, to celebrate and uh, you know, thanks to Dr. T.R. Sarma who initiated this at this institute. And in fact, uh, when I was a DG ICR, I insisted that every institute should have Foundation Day. IRI was not having Foundation Day celebration till then. And uh, after joining uh, uh, my joining as a director here, we initiated Foundation Day of uh, celebration of IRI. So now, uh, you know, uh, 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 this is a day to remember what uh, and uh, and also rejoice uh, with all that we have accomplished. And this is the day also. Uh, to, uh, you know, again, uh, uh, resolve what we intend to do and where we have faltered and what we intend to do and with a resolve. And we should be really doing in a time frame what all we should deliver. Dr. T.R. Sarma has already given uh, a brief outline of what needs to be really done, what is being done, and I believe all of you are inspired. Uh, to move ahead. All the students, faculties who are present here, wish you all the very best, heartiest congratulations on this day. And my tribute to Professor Vian Chopra, uh, who established this institution and enabled us uh, uh, to be part of this uh, and then continue uh, uh, series to be part of this. And all the new generation of students certainly would be immensely benefiting from this uh, institution as we go along. Uh, with this, thank you very much, Dr. Bhattacharya, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir, for the beautiful words. So before we proceed with today's lecture, that is Professor V.L. Chopra Foundation Day Lecture, may I request the Assistant Director General Seat, ICR, Dr. D.K. Adava, sir, to introduce our distinguished speaker, Professor Shantanu Bhattacharya. Thank you. Good morning to all. Honorable Chairman of today's session, Dr. Sanjay Kumar, Chairman SRB, Dr. T. Mahapatra, sir, the Chairperson PPFRA and former Secretary Dare and DGICR. Today's speaker, Dr. Shantanu Bhattacharya ji, Director Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research. Drupati, our Honorable Deputy Director General of Crop Sciences, Dr. Tilakraj Sharma ji, Dr. R.P. Sharma ji, the former Director of this esteemed institute, Dr. Bhattacharya, and uh, amongst the audience, very senior our peers sitting here, Dr. Sudhir Sapori, the Chairman of RAC of this institute, Dr. K. R. Kondal, the former director of this institute, Dr. N. K. Singh, the na former national professor, Dr. Anil Grover, the director of Honorable Dr. V. L. Chopadaji, Dr. Vashali ji, Dr. Vishnathan, Dr. Parmanan, Dr. Padaria, Dr. Srinivasan, and uh, all the colleagues, the head of the divisions from IRI and VPGR, and all the scientist colleagues from the NIPB as well as all the sister institutes, dear students, all the staff members, administrative, technical, supporting as well as the young professional RASRS, and all colleagues present in, at this very important event. Here today, I welcome all of you on the behalf of the Council and on the behalf of this, my personal behalf. And uh, I also join my seniors, Dr. Mahapatra Sahib and Dr. Sharma ji, in congratulating all of you for the, I think, a very nice journey which the Institute has taken till now. And uh, on this very auspicious occasion of its Foundation Day, today and uh, we express our gratitude to our Honorable late Professor V.L. Chopra 
for visualizing this importance of plant biotechnology long back in agriculture and establishing this great institute which is the mother of all the plant biotechnology developments in the country which we are seeing today. We talk of the human resource development, we talk of any genomic resources in plant sciences which have been developed. So that is all the outcome of this institute and you go anywhere in any institute, in any state agriculture university, so we'll find our own students working there in the various positions. So that is the proud uh, contribution of this great institute. And the contribution now which is coming, we have now more than 100 varieties which have been developed through the marker selection and which are getting the momentum and uh, under the guidance of Dr. T. Mahapatra, I used to compile that document and now with the guidance and advice of Dr. T. R. Sharma. So we have a great work which is going on and that is all because of the establishment of this institute, otherwise we could have missed this opportunity. So now I have been given a very important task to introduce our today's speaker. So I feel privileged and honored to introduce our today's professor, uh, speaker, Professor Shantanu Bhattacharya, who is currently Director of Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research at Trupati. So I'll be having a just a brief journey about his academic and professional career before we invite him for speaking. So Dr. Bhattacharya is a well-known scientist in the field of chemical sciences. He did his B.Sc. Honours and Master's degree from Kolkata University in chemistry. He did his PhD from Rutger University in New Brunswick with the world-renowned scientist Professor Robert A. Moss. After his PhD, he joined as his postdoctoral stint with Professor Hargovin Khurana. All of you are well aware about the contribution of Professor Khurana, a Nobel laureate of Indian origin at the MIT in USA. And, uh, uh, he worked uh, on the signal transduction of the membrane proteins there during his postdoctorate work with Professor Khurana. Later he joined the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore in 1991 and served on the different capacities as assistant professor, associate professor and professor till 2001. And from 2001 till 2003 he worked as the chairman of the chair of the department of organic chemistry and professor up to 2023 when he joined as the director of uh, his current assignment as the director of IISCR Tirupati. He also served as an honorary pre professor of the Jawaharlal Nehru Center for Advanced Scientific Research Department of Science and Technology at the Indian Institute of Science Bangalore also. And uh, Regarding the, he also served the director of the Indian Associations for the Cultivation of Sciences, Kolkata. A long list of the various awards and recognitions are there, but I will be in a brief just to introduce few of them I will be mentioning. The one is the BM Birla Prize, the MARSI Medal, the NYS Prize, GD Birla Award, Twars Prize, and Renvexi Research Award, and many more. He is an a selected fellow of the Indian National Science Academy, New Delhi, Indian Academy of Sciences, Bangalore, and the World Academy of Sciences, uh, Trustee. Dr. Bhattacharya is the recipient of one of the most highest science award of our country, uh, Shanti Saru Bhatnakar Prize from the Government of India in 2003 for his contribution to the chemical sciences. His areas of interest are of uh, at the uh, interface of chemistry, biology and material sciences. He has published more than 300 journals of repute and guided several postgraduate doctors and doctoral scholars. He served on the editorial board, uh, editorial and advisory boards of many of the high-ranked journals also, including the American Chemical Society. Uh, Society. We are, sir, grateful to you for accepting our request to deliver the most pre prestigious Professor V. L. Chopra Foundation Day lecture on the use of alternative technology for sustainable pest control in crops and sensor designs for agriculture. The, your interest in the agriculture sciences 
will definitely lead to the future collaborations with your institute and we are sure the science of agriculture will be definitely benefited by the complementing your novel ideas in the field of chemical sciences. The specifically our young scientists and students, they will be motivated with your new ideas and the vision which you are going to present. And uh, we uh, now I invite you, sir, for delivering Professor V. L. Chopra Foundation Day lecture. Thank you very much, sir. Good morning, everyone. And thank you very much, Dr. Yadava, for your kind words of introduction. I acknowledge uh, Dr. Sanjay Kumar, the Chairman ASRB, the Chief Guest of this function, Dr. Trilachan Mahapatra, former Secretary, DAR and Director General ICAR, Dr. R.C. Bhattacharya, Director NIPB, Dr. T.R. Sarma, DDG, ICAR, Dr. A.K. Singh, Director IARI, Dr. D.K. Yadava, ADG, ICAR, Professor Sopori, uh, former Vice Chancellor of JNU, and Chairman RAC of NIPB, Professor Grovar, and many other distinguished delegates, the students, staff of this institution present here in this occasion. At the outset, let me wish you a very happy Makar Sankranti Bihu or Lahori or Uttarayan, whatever way you would like to observe it. This is the last day of the winter coinciding with the ascending phase of sun. I am particularly honored to be present here where we are commemorating the legend who has brought about this institution, Professor Virendra Lal Chopra, Padma Bhushan, an outstanding educationist, renowned biotechnologist, geneticist, agriculturist, and of course, a former director general of the ICAR, known for his path-breaking contributions to the development of wheat production in India. He also served as chancellor of a number of universities, and it's very befitting that this institution is organizing the Founders' Day uh, to commemorate his vision. And I am also pleased to see uh, Baisali Ji, uh, daughter of Professor Chopra. ICAR NIPB is celebrating its Foundation Day today on the 15th of January 2024. I'm given to understand that this started as a small center of biotechnology 38 years ago under the tutelage of Professor Chopra and became an independent research institute, ICR and IPB in 2019, known for its research in mustard hybrid, Pusa Jaikisan, BT Brinjal, among others, and made forays into new areas of research involving genome editing, DNA marker production, and so on and so forth. I congratulate you, one and all. Foundation Day is an occasion to make the pledge to take the Institute to newer heights. And it's about building institution for tomorrow to serve science for the society. I come from an autonomous higher education institution of national importance of the Ministry of Education. And of course, I have 
I am not a literate person in agricultural science, so please uh, bear with me. You know, we try to do science um, from fundamental principles, primarily using uh, chemistry as a tool, chemical biology as a tool, and I will make my presentation. But I think we are at a time we face unprecedented challenges because of the climate change, in addition to the fact that India has undergone a metamorphosis with excess of excess water country to a water deficient country. So this has um, created new challenges. Let me tell you, as I speak, I have, uh, our research has been uh, receiving attention from United States and Australia because of the fact that they, there are growing changes in terms of climate which makes uh, uh, you know new types of strategies that may be required to deal with the problem to cope with these challenges and uh, we also need to train a new quality of human resources and as uh, Dr. Jadova has very rightly says, we will hand hold, uh, will hold hands together uh, to uh, re train uh, our students uh, so that you know they are uh, trained at the latest in terms of capabilities, in terms of the challenges that you need to deal with uh, to circumvent the problem. So, if I may start my presentation, uh, we, we use uh, various kinds of strategies to understand some of the problems. Uh, is this on? Yeah. This uh, particular area of research, as you would imagine, it's highly multidisciplinary in character, where we have challenges to deal with uh, crop improvement to sustainable use, employment of alternative technologies, including nanotechnology. You have to develop biomimetic chemistry, where you can actually bring in hydrolysis of cell wall at ambient condition or near ambient condition. Some of these are very relevant in the development of new genera of health and medicine and also to develop sensors, forensics and taxonomy. So all of these are uh, part of this thing which uh, relates to these kind of issues. And um, you know, we all know about the pesticide development. Pesticides have created uh, many new challenges for the reason why, you know, one has to make new types of molecules. I'm not going to deal with too many molecules here, uh, just because of the nature of the audience. But I will give you one example, you know, this is neonicotinoid insecticides. You know, these are a group of insecticides with a chemical structure that is simulating nicotine. They are more selective. They have directed toxicity to insects than to mammals and are less harmful than most of the older class of insecticides. I think I can give you an example. One of the most widely used nicotinoid, neonicotinoid insecticide that is imida uh, clopride, which is considerably less toxic to people than caffeine. Yet, its toxicity you can measure, it's twice that of very well-known painkiller ibuprofen. So, these are shifts in strategy in development of insecticide. Nevertheless, if you go to FMC, one of the Fortune 500 company which has utilized 
uh, new types of pesticides over decades has actually now made a transition in terms of its strategy to develop uh, antidote for pests. Now integrated pest management is all well known. It is um, integral to meeting the food requirements, particularly in a world where the population is growing all the time. India has become number one country in terms of population recently. And uh, reduction of crop losses from pest attack in a sustainable way is one of the important objectives towards this direction. But, you know, various strategies that you utilize, there are threats and outcomes. When pesticides are used, a certain amount remains on the crop and is used in used containers. Procedures must be developed to make sure these do not negatively impact the health and environment. So, one must consider the issues such as the re-entry and post a pre-harvest interval, a proper disposal of wastes, and one should avoid using illegal and counterfeit pesticides. Now, as we have been talking about this particular institute, which has a great deal of emphasis in terms of genetically engineered crops, the biotechnological approaches. So that is one of the important role that one needs to consider. And then also potential for area-wide pest management. Now these problems that lie ahead, you know, in scenario India, as I mentioned, this has crossed China in terms of population recently. And main crops, um, uh, which need to be targeted, you know, I can only mention a few examples, for example, Helicobarpa armigera or similar kind of uh, crops, uh, the, the bug which actually affect whole variety of uh, uh, agricultural producers. And India loses estimated close to 1.3 billion US dollars crop yield due to pest attacks every year. But the technology which is available for the pheromone emitted, the volatiles emitted by these sort of pests are actually uh, unusable in the real life field. For example, one can use uh, gas chromatography, GCMS technique. One can use, uh, you know, EAG electro antennogram and uh, similar uh, kind of technology for the detection of uh, very small quantity of this kind of volatiles. Or even one can employ digital camera for field monitoring, but some of these things are possible in Western countries, but this is certainly not possible in a country like India. So, so all of these strategies are actually impractical. And therefore, one needs to think about uh, how to deal with the problems of pests and unsuccessful use of insecticides, pesticides, and pheromone traps. So one needs to have a careful monitoring and application uh, of remedies at the appropriate time before pest infection. So can we actually sense the female sex pheromone prior to the infestation event. Uh, and that is what uh, one has been, one kind of uh, approach that we have been looking at. And so these uh, pheromone sensors, actually they emit, uh, the, the, these bugs actually emit. Our objective was to um, confuse the space uh, in terms of their mating event. Uh, so these, uh, what we do, we, we actually assess in a field uh, what kind of insect is there. If there is no insect present whatsoever, that should be a green light signal. You can actually get your Android and a farmer should be able to find it out. 
in a, um, you know, just looking at going to the field if you actually integrate the chip. If there are a certain degree of infestation, there will be a yellow light. And if there is rampant infestation, that could be a red light. So one does not need to use any sophisticated equipment, but use some kind of a cheap, integrated, go there and find out. So this works with this principle. So we actually entrap pheromone in a nanofibrillar gel. And, you know, this actually simulates the opposite sex of the given pest. And so they come and, you know, they get trapped. So that's basically the simple uh, technology that we follow. In order to create this kind of chip, we have developed, you know, MEMS devices which are basically based on silica, silica surface. So you can see these are cantilever. Cantilever, you know, has been functionalized using sophisticated organic synthesis. I'm not going to get into that, but you can see on the right side uh, the kind of, um, this, this is the kind of functionalization we do which actually entails the uh, bugs to be attracted and you can see uh, this is the sensing of female sex pheromone of Helicovarpa armigera and you can see uh, depending on uh, that, that you can see the limit, uh, limit of detection is 4 femtogram that is 10 raised to minus 15 gram. Imagine the sensitivity and the accuracy of the volatiles that come out. This actually follow a very uh, well physics that you have studied as students I'm telling you, you know, you have studied infrared spectroscopy where the Hooke's law which is connected with your vibration efficiency is actually monitored through this. So you just follow that and you can detect um, this kind of bug in a very early phase of the game. So actually we have done this experiment in our laboratory uh, in, a, you know, in, a, uh, in a laboratory environment and you know, we have detected at various conditions, presence of bug, absence of bug and so on and so forth uh, using tomato plants and um, I think this again is uh, published where we have utilized the silica based surface which has been uh, derivatized with beta cyclodextrin which is a trap. These are uh, femtogram level emission of these volatile pheromone which gets trapped onto the surface that has been created. And you can follow this very efficiently and uh, you can, uh, I think this recently published, so one can get information regarding the uh, details of any field that you go with reference to uh, this kind of volatile emission. Now this can be the, the power of this technology comes because you can actually tailor the surface, any surface you take. So suppose if you have a surface, you can actually write whatever you want, tailor to a given pest. So it should be possible to extend this technology in uh, various kinds of uh, crops where you know the invading pathogen, the pest that is actually attacking. Actually, when we have first uh, developed this, I think a group in Pennsylvania State University got attracted and subsequently Australian National University and Carvera, they are also trying to um, approach us to develop a collaborative scheme where we will be able to uh, deal with different types of uh, volatiles that come out of a given plant and tailor it uh, to the needs of that. So the advantages of the present invention is that the optical resonant mass sensors which follow the Hooke's law as I mentioned is it's fairly rapid and energy efficient detection of the volatile and you can use it several times. It's not just, not just you just go 
and in one go it gets saturated, you throw them off? No. As long as you keep the surface clean, it can be used again and again. Covalently functionalized devices are robust because you cannot scrape them off whether you are dealing with uh, flood or rain or high heat. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, these follow the principle of reversibility of optical sensing and therefore, uh, you know, once the detection is over, you can use it again uh, by cleaning the surface. Capable of selectively measuring the pheromone concentration, as I mentioned, 10 raised to minus 15 gram or femtogram level shows high selectivity, excellent efficacy and stability in open atmosphere even during the rainy season or in peak summer at, as far as the particular system that we have examined. And you know, transportation of these pheromone nanosensors is trouble free for the localized treatment of uh, pesticides. So hence the approach may be efficiently and economically carried forward from the research laboratory to the agricultural field. So this is where I call upon ICAR, which is our nodal agency, uh, to bring about, you know, the, I think the, the ICAR has actually uh, touched every life of this country. It has done revolution. We all know Dr. Swaminathan's work. So I think because of the, uh, you know, changing scenario, in, you increased voice space resistance, their mutagenations, you have various other challenges that are coming up, so we would like to invoke new technology. And uh, so this is, you know, many of these things are patented and published in different literature. Uh, I think this is available if anybody is interested. Uh, we can have a discussion on this uh, for, uh, you know, different kinds of uh, pest control. So we have actually uh, gone ahead in taking this up on another level. So, you know, the nano sensors we have tried to integrate with the help of an industry in Bangalore, GR Agritech Labs, uh, to integrate uh, to the Internet of Things UAV platforms for remote monitoring throughout an agricultural field which is feasible. And uh, the mapping of the area of possible pest infestation can be figured out and you can actually monitor sitting in Delhi, you can monitor in Karnataka because all you require is the data transmission. So localized and timely release of highly, uh, you know, when the pesticides in a very early phase where, you know, pest infestation is a very early phase. So you can use, if at all you have to use pesticides, you can bring down the concentration of it by orders of magnitude. That would not actually uh, create havoc among the population who are involved, the workers in the farm and the neighborhood population. Tailored development of new sensors for various applications of mutual interest. So, you know, this is a, we have actually incorporated some of these chiefs, you know, in Dharwad district uh, in Karnataka. And you can see this is a drone that we have created. These drones actually has taken uh, the, you know, this chief and trying to sniff the level of infestation. So that's basically, you know, drones are being used in many things. So it's commonplace today. So one can use this. Uh, fairly effectively for such applications. I will give you another application that we have undertaken uh, in Varanasi some years ago and this is, uh, uh, this I can show, show here an uh, example of Bacter Bacterocera dorsalis. This is a fruit fly. We all know that India is world renowned for its mango and um, also, guava, one of the best tasty variety. Unfortunately, because of this pest infestation, I think uh, if you slice them uh, in England, they will not touch it because they see that this kind of maggot is inside. So, this is a challenge. So, here I have shown you 
um, uh, very simple uh, you know method there we have actually made a gelator and you can see the this gelator is a chemical uh, this chemical actually this is methyl eugenol this is the pheromone we can use this and we can make the gel and you can see the gel is set and you can see the gel samples for the field test and these are excellent capsules for doing sustained release and we have done kinetics of its release in different temperatures i have shown here you can see if you actually keep the pheromone itself it volatilizes in no time in open ambient temperature however we can sustain this even at 50 degree temperature at the loss of or volatilization of the pheromone from such capsules is significantly minimized making it available uh, for inducing the mating disorder that i have mentioned so you know i have shown here you know this is on a tlc plate you can see the bugs are coming even after 3 weeks you can see while uh, this particular one that pure pheromone it does not attract but you can see just up in the morning if we put it the bugs are still getting attracted because they think uh, this is you know their opposite uh, sex and they come for mating and then they are fooled so this is the technology we use a very simple technology you know we can use a, in a field uh, an inverted used uh, um, a bottle you know this uh, water bottle which we throw so these you make a small window here and you put the gel here so gel is hanging from the top and you put little bit of water and you can see this is the through which you you can see the bugs are entering and uh, you know once they get inside i think they get uh, eventually they fall because of high energy uh, they they within in the confinement and you know you can see the heats you can calculate the statistical details and again Uh, this project um, we have utilized the funding from a hyderabad uh, uh, company atgc biotech private limited so this is actually in Bar varanasi we have done that uh, you can see uh, they, they, these are the experiments that we have done using this nano gel uh, i think in the interest of time i will not discuss this uh, any longer if anyone is interested i'll be happy to discuss this in further details so essentially one can characterize this with all its mechanical engineering properties uh, along with the uh, use of chemistry and biology uh, and entomology and one would be able to come up with a multidisciplinary solution for achieving efficient management of fruit pests using this kind of pheromone nanogel so we have been also interested as i mentioned to you uh, there are various other kinds of uh, problems which we know that there are harmful pests which actually affect i have given you uh, shown here a few examples and uh, you know s litura is one of the you know uh, well known uh, one well known bug you know in the known as tobacco cutworm or cotton leafworm and these are you know male female species is all known 87 species of host plants have been infested by them and we know about uh, their life cycle and it is uh, this develops uh, resistance to several commercial insecticides such as malathion pyrethrin you know all of these things do not endosulfan they don't function very effectively and so there is a growing need for environment friendly uh, microbial pathogens uh, such as s litura which is based in uh, nuclear polyhedro uh, uh, says virus that kind of sl npv to control the hazardous pest but this is uh, this may be available commercially but nobody uh, there is no method available to Uh, check its quality so i think we we thought of developing a sensor this is another approach by which we would like to assay 
the quality of such formulation and here I will present a, you know an executably uh, easy uh, rapid optical assay for the detection so essentially uh, so you can see these commercial biopesticides um, which HA NPV which is marketed in this name and uh, so we we try to figure out the you know how to estimate their presence. So we use chemistry here, you know, we use two principles of fluorescent spectroscopy. One is aggregation induced emission environment, the other one is motion induced uh, emission environment. We call it AIE and this is called MICE. And what happens, I'll give you an example. So if you actually change solvent, you can see they're changing the color, same molecule. And you can do turn on and turn off, depending on this scenario. So I show here on-field detection of Helicoverpa parmigera, uh, nuclear polyhedrosis virus. You can see, uh, you can see the solution phase detection. You can follow this. There is a pronounced color change, and one would be able to figure out presence of this uh, virus. Whether in the formulation you have adequate active uh, material in the uh, in the formulation that is present. So essentially, we use a very simple chemistry where we use uh, we employ this molecule. Uh, I think this does not have battery, I suppose. Anyway. So essentially, you can see the right hand side, the molecule which undergoes this kind of inter, intramolecular rotation following the MICE principle and give you different color. And this is again uh, from published literature, one would be able to follow that. Uh, so these are, uh, you know, different kind of uh, materials inside which uh, this can be detected. This is also detection on the leaf surface, the polyhedral occlusion bodies uh, on the surface of various kinds of fruits one can look at. One can look at in, the, uh, in cabbage, in oat, in cardamom, in cumin, in black pepper, in okra, brinjal and so on and so forth. So one would be able to uh, assay the level and make the quality control. Similarly, one can use it for peas, lentils, chickpeas, maize, mung bean, and so on and so forth. This is yet another molecule which we have developed. This forms a luminescent complex for SLNPV sensing, which is yet another, uh, you know, the, the effects are uh, that these uh, plants that are affected. Again, this is based in occlusion body, which is a negatively charged protein layer of the polyhedron protein. And one can use this. Uh, again, we develop this molecule using multiple stage synthesis. And uh, then uh, finally, we show their property. The luminescence property is shown on the right hand side. Uh, and you can see the color changes, you know, there follows uh, ligand charge transfer versus um, uh, metal to ligand charge transfer, you see there is a different color formation. So you can see here interaction with SLNPV biopesticides, the color changes as you change the concentration from green to red. You can follow this very easily. You do not require any sophisticated uh, instrumentation, no GCMS, no antennogram, you can just follow this using this technology. So we have studied the mechanism. I will not go into the details. This involves details chemistry, and this is not the uh, you know occasion to talk about all these things. But I think we have been able to detect SLNPV in agricultural crops, and this is uh, usable. And I think uh, this has been published in ACS Agri uh, Science and Technology recently. Uh, one can follow this in paper strips also. Yet another uh, molecule that is very highly used is paraquat. You know, we know about the deaths from accidental ingestion of paraquat, which is highly toxic to human 
and one small accidental sip is often fatal and there is no antidote known. The other problem with paraquat, some of you may be aware of, that paraquat, that residue that remains in the uh, fruit or any vegetable that we ingest, this eventually is one of the suspected causative, suspected causative agent for the ailment uh, that is Parkinsonism. Therefore, this is banned now. However, it's being widely used and, you know, so even if, you know, uh, the paraquat is present, uh, it's in different water solute uh, samples in the flora and fauna, you will find them, they are present, even in milk that we take, because uh, the grass which is taken or herbs that is taken by the cattle, there are trace quantities of paraquat, they ingest it, and so, you know, through the excreta, they uh, infect. Uh, so there are uh, d different types of, you know, we know various types of uh, insecticides, fungicides, larvicides we use, the paraquat is one of them, and then we try to develop a sensor for that. And this is a sensor which actually works very well in terms of calorimetric sensing, and you can see the, the nanoparticle that we have developed. The chemistry is shown here. The paraquat, which is colorless, it, it undergoes a change. You can see blue color formation, and you can read out effectively. So this we have done, detection of paraquat in various agricultural crops, uh, and uh, this has been uh, totally quantifiable in terms of its content. And again, the, this is published literature, one can do in high throughput, uh, you know, multi-well uh, assay, one can figure out the quali quality of different type of uh, uh, food products that one use. This is based on cadmium telluride based nanoparticle. Another thing is that quality of, uh, quantity of oxalates that are produced uh, in uh, various crops, one should be able to figure out the contents of the ox oxalate in spinach we have done. Various other uh, media you can figure out. Uh, uh, so you can see the color changes, you know, the copper complex of this molecule, actually in presence of oxalate, it becomes colorless. And so, the other strategy that we use is involving lipid nanoparticles, uh, that we actually develop whole variety of lipid-based nanoparticles, these are completely benign uh, systems. We also use inorganic particles, polymer-based nanoparticles, and nanogels I have talked about. So, these can be used very effectively in complexing with the DNA and RNA molecule. Uh, you know, some of these things are commercial, uh, commercial reagents, they are available. Uh, you know, the, for in the context of crop protection, lipofectamine, Gengiplas, uh, selfectin, and so on and so forth. These are actually used for animal cell uh, transfection. Now, this can be actually taken forward. Actually, I mean, this lab, I don't have to introduce, you know, the naturally occurring bacterium that produces a protein toxic to certain types of insects. The gene that is uh, inside the bacteria, which is responsible for producing the Bt gene, uh, can be transferred to crops, making them more resistant to the corresponding insects. So that principle, one can actually tailor it depending on the requirement that you have. So we have actually done uh, various kinds of EPCAM uh, based, uh, you know, PIMAR. This is largely because of our interest in making and this uh, CRISPR uh, CS9 all in one in plasmid, and we can actually insert different type of uh, uh, sequences to make the recombinant chimera and then try to affect them. I think we have done these in uh, you know 
taking care of the regression of tumor cell in animal but i think this is possible to incorporate uh, in plants one can actually use uh, this um, uh, you know since we have de developed ionic liquid based um, the cell wall dissolving biomimetic systems which can actually you do not require sulfuric acid we you do not require very high or low ph treatment but you can uh, dissolve that and using uh, in conjunction with that such technology one should be able to have effective uh, integration of these strategies i think uh, with this i make a transition since i am in a ministry of education institution uh, we are in the process of uh, creating a professional masters in precision agriculture and uh, uh, we also invoke the concept of um, center of plant science and this this has come about because of the advent of new uh, policy and new educational policy and uh, you know so the, we should also i call upon you uh, for redefining the agriculture education in the changed global scenario uh, see you know the uh, agriculture is undergoing a big challenge particularly in the context of india and to align with the changing global scenario the education and extension system has to be redefined the market oriented agriculture education and extension along with the changes in agricultural marketing policy for the national and international uh, market use the need of the hour i think we are facing different uh, you know uh, industrial houses for their uh, you know business interest these are conflicts uh, they have conflict with the principles that we develop we need to actually have our own team a cadre of uh, social scientists we require we re you know to bring in uh, agri business we need to have uh, marketing management skills uh, rural sociology agricultural anthropology uh, and some of these uh, aspects uh, as enumerated in the uh, ambit of uh, national education policy uh, published in the year 2020 so i think since uh, you are uh, spearheading the national academy of agricultural sciences i'm sure uh, you will be able to empower our agri graduates and scientists to face up to the challenges uh, of the national and international market so so the quality relevance reach and preparedness of the young agri tech graduates are very important so one needs to have strategies and in institutional reforms to meet that and um, as the agriculture sector is becoming more complex due to the globalization and climate change and to cope with these challenges so we need to have uh, you know identified i thought that there are few constraints that that are obviously visible difficulty in attracting best talented students this to this field you find most of the students i come you know i right now i am in andhra pradesh andhra pradesh i find you know this is number 2 in terms of number of students who pass out of class 12 uh, with science background they are number 2 in the whole country but when it comes to taking up science this is number 17 because you know everybody is attracted to medicine everybody is attracted to uh, engineering and eventually engineering is taken away by it you require uh, people you know today in australia if you want immigration a plumber is more valued than a professor or a scientist so these are the reality we have to live in and therefore you know we we must uh, incorporate elements to attract the bright talented students we have to educate them we have to uh, and the other issue is that many many vacancies of uh, state agricultural universities i think i have been sensitized early in the morning that you have a reverse pyramid situation so this is a this is the again a issue you know inbreeding of faculty lack of autonomy 
to the Vice Chancellor's non-uniform state center and poor state SAU relationship. So these are the challenges. These are, I'm talking about non-scientific political challenges, but we need to, uh, 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 you know, work around that. So I would call upon, uh, I think this gives us great opportunity. We can, we, we are, we are, uh, we can offer degrees because we have, we are the national center of excellence we, we, in terms of, you know, autonomy in the, in terms of education. So we are transforming a, a new program that we would like to uh, start from the coming fall that is in the August. So I would uh, call upon uh, my colleagues in ICAR ecosystem uh, in, uh, you know, please uh, hold hand with us. So we would be able to create new agricultural tech parks to promote technology, incubation and dissemination and promote sustainable methodology. And uh, so agriculture must be looked at now. Uh, it's an industry. Uh, although you are institution which is supported by the government, but I think we must mechanize, uh, we incorporate, increase mechanization, automation, use on uh, different type of technologies. I mentioned a few, uh, you know, data management, big data analytics, ICT uh, will be the order of the day. And uh, uh, blockchain technology, biosensors, nanotechnology, I mentioned few examples from our own program. Uh, Non-fossil fuel, renewable energy, solar power, waste management will greatly impact agri-food system and should be internalized in the agriculture curriculum. And we are, actually we have a bunch of faculty members, young faculty members, they are trained internationally uh, in various uh, areas of plant sciences. In addition to that, we have uh, social scientists who have exposure in terms of the economics of this. Uh, so we are trying to set up, uh, we are starting up uh, the incubation center, technology development center, uh, and center for frontier areas of research, and uh, try to bring in uh, institute, uh, research institute, academia and industry linkages. And these interdisciplinary research, including the uh, different human resources and social science research, I think uh, would be the order of the day. This is the way most of the countries are moving forward. With this, I, I would like to close my talk. And again, I would like to thank you for your kind attention. Thank you so much, sir, for delivering such a wonderful and insightful le uh, lecture. Your expertise and perspective have added immense value to our celebration. We are truly grateful for your presence and the knowledge you have shared with us today. Following this informative lecture, uh, we are honored to have our chief guest, chairman of the Agri uh, Agricultural Scientist Recruitment Board, Dr. Sanjay Kumar. I request, sir, to address the gathering, please. Very good afternoon to all of you. And uh, my heartiest congratulations for the Foundation Day of NIPB. Sitting on the dais today, we have the speaker of the day, uh, Professor Shantanu Bhattacharya, Honorable Dr. R.P. Sharmaji, who had been our teacher, Dr. Tilopan Mata, Tilochan Mahapadraji, who is chairman of PP VFRA and uh, our close friend and also who had been the chairman of our research council. Uh, we had Dr. T.R. Sharma, again very close friend, right from Palampur days. So good to see him now. So he came to Delhi and he brought me to Delhi also. So <laughs> reuniting in Delhi. We all from Palampur. Dr. D.K. Yadavji uh, from Seed Science Technology ADG and uh, uh, 
I think it's always very good to interact with him. He always keeps you giving some new ideas. So anybody who wants to have a new idea, please come and interact with him and you will get some or the other new idea. Uh, Dr. Bhattacharya, uh, Director of NIPB, and in the hall today we have uh, Professor Sapori, uh, who has, I think, uh, after doing my master's, first lab which I visited and uh, Dr. Sapori was kind enough to take me in his lab. Although I was in his lab only for 28 days, thereafter I got admission at IRI. But sir, I must tell you, just in 20 days, 28 days what I gathered there, I translated several of them even for my PhD and later in my work because the work on protein that I started in your lab I think that was very significant. And then when you were chairman of our RC, you had been guiding us all through. Uh, then we have uh, uh, Dr. Kondal Saab and uh, anybody who has to work at IRI at that time in the area of plant biochemistry and molecular biology. I don't think in that period anybody has gone without going to his lab. He was the only person who would tell everybody how to run a gel, how to extract DNA, RNA. Then we have Professor N.K. Singh. I think if you talk of genome sequencing at NIPP, then he is the man who is there. Professor Anil Grover, sir, he is our guru bhai. And we are so proud when we were doing our PhD, we heard for the first time that role of HSPs. And I think high molecular weight HSPs. Earlier people were talking of some other weight, but he came out with new concept and paper in plant molecule biology at that time. It made and all of us so inspiring that in India we can do that sort of work. Uh, we have Vaishali ji, Professor Chopra always used to talk about her. Uh, whenever he was in Palampur, whenever he would come to IHBT, we learnt a lot about you from him and today for the first time I am meeting you. Maybe in Palampur when we vis visit next time, I will ensure that we meet you at your home at Palampur. Uh, Dr. Vishwanathan we have here, um, when we are doing our PhD, he was doing masters and, uh, uh, and today he is leading this institute as a JDR. I think it is a very big responsibility he is having. Dr. Brahmanan, Dr. Padaria sahab. And, uh, while I was at IHBT, I worked a lot on enzymes and today Dr. Srinivasanji is here and he taught us all enzymes. So whatever enzymatic enzymology we learnt, it was because of him. And I am seeing in the hall uh, Dr. Renu and uh, all other esteemed colleagues in the hall and uh, youngsters, I can see a lot many youngsters in this hall. Uh, so once again, heartiest congratulations for the day. And uh, today happens to be the Makar Sakranti, so congratulations for the day also. And you know, when Dr. Bhattacharya ji was talking about Makar Sakranti, it just reminded me that such a pious day is today. And our mythology says, please, it's a scientific organization, but I think a word on mythology would be important for some important thing. It says that today Lord Son, uh, Lord Son, you know, Suraj, goes to his son, S.O. and son, Shani's house. And father and son, they are never in close, you know, in a good terms with each other. But on today, they visit each other, they remove all the differences with them. So I think for a scientific organization, if there is any difference in any of the person, I think today is the day. And today happens to be the foundation day. I think nothing pious and nothing better than this. And also mythology also says that today Lord Vishnu had removed the terror of all the demons. So it was a day of liberation. So anybody who is, any, who is having any fear, I think today they should live with their heads up. And uh, it's a day to celebrate. And what better day to celebrate such a day when you have person like this lecture in the name of Professor V.L. Chopra. And uh, if you, anybody who has 
any association with Professor Chopra, um, he will ensure these two traits are not at all in the society or in the education place. He will ensure that people work with full freedom. He will ensure that there is no gap between a teacher and the associates. I give you an example when I was at Palampur and uh, you know if he has any work with us he will never ever come and say, he come and meet me. He will say you please continue where you are wherever and whenever I have work I will come and he will come just for two minutes as soon as his work is over he will just go away. He said even if I sit here for a cup of tea I will be wasting your time. So that sort of personality uh, Professor Chopra was. And uh, uh, in one of the function, one evening, uh, we had invited him for a Foundation Day lecture. And in the garden we were sitting and he told us that there are seven sins in the scientific society, which at least youngsters should never follow those sins. And uh, I noted those sins and I'll read it for you which Professor Chopra told, I think, for the benefit of everyone. Uh, he related it with seven sins, what, Dr. Ma uh, what the Mahatma Gandhiji used to say, right? But he said, in scientific society, there, there are seven sins, and I'll read uh, for all of you. He says, in science, hypothesis without conviction. That's the greatest sin most of us are doing. We just keep on doing something, we don't have any, any hypothesis why we are doing. You ask anybody, X, Y, Z had said and therefore we are conducting it. Then he said, observation with bias. We know what we are looking for. He said, this is the greatest thing and therefore you are not able to come out with some new ideas, some new hypothesis. He said, if at all you are a scientist, you should not have any biases. Then he said third sin is cowardliness in accepting error. If something happens bad, we never accept, we come and defend it. He said that's wrong. You see, person like him who has uh, so much experience in science and administration, that is, these are his words, these are not my words, please. I have noted it, therefore I am reading it. Then he said that defense when proved wrong. We all become defensive. He said we should never ever do that. Then he said asserting without evidence. Uh, today you are seeing all social media signs, uh, uh, where, whether there are ev evidence or not, everybody will say you eat this, you eat that, you will reduce weight for example. So he said that there should be uh, evidence based science and ev evidence based observation. Then he says that persisting in delusion, we always persist in delusion that we are X, Y, Z. And last he said that career without curiosity. And uh, all our youngsters, and he said that particularly good for youngsters, they should start with their career with lot of curiosity. Unless they have that curiosity, they cannot move forward. So I think on today's day, in an institute like NIPB, I think what could be better attribute to commemorate and pay our tribute to Professor Chopra than this particular lecture. So thank you so much Professor Bhattacharya ji and also Professor Shantanu Bhattacharya ji for giving such an excellent lecture. Today actually we have two Bhattacharya ji. One is director but both of them are director but one is for ICER and one is for NIPB. And uh, today what we learned from, so I noted a few points and I think uh, in the last he made a very important uh, point that, you know, agriculture has to be seen as an enterprise and I think that was very significant point. And uh, he mentioned all those technologies, right from nanotechnology for detection of uh, uh, all sorts of uh, herbicide, pesticide, control and he very importantly what he mentioned is that science today is not alone. Like he integrated engineering, biology, all of chemistry, all of them together. Whether it was making a new molecule, whether it was developing a sensing mechanism, whether it was doing at a large scale cultivation. Uh, so whether you had to deploy 
uh, drone based technology we all are talking of this technology and he showed it and uh, once he was uh, uh, discussing about commercialization uh, i reminded of a old article in nature outlook outlook in 2016 there was an article and it talk of commercialization in science and uh, that article is stated that whenever government says that we look for economic value government is right government is spending money on us and government in lieu wants that what best use may we make out of that money and i think that article if youngsters have not read and if you heard today's lecture so carefully i think you should certainly go and read that lecture in nature outlook and uh, uh, i really like that article a lot and uh, at isbt um, we sir under your uh, chairmanship we try to make some similar changes uh, even at isbt i remember keeping on the same line in 1992 i was in henry wens lab at texas tech and uh, i heard one lecture and that was on ma map based cloning in tomato and idea of that work was that they wanted to have the tomato where it should be a jointless petal so they were doing cloning for that and they said why they want to do it because tomato industry sauce industry Uh, the harvesting or you know when you have tomato you have calyx attached to the tomato and they wanted to have tomato without calyx and um, if they can do by gene uh, by map based cloning they can identify that gene they can remove that trait that would be so useful and you know it that in course of time that that sort of thing came up so they are doing hardcore basic science but they are keeping in view that who is the taker of that product once they come out of it and if there is a taker of that product then only they will undertake that sort of science and i think that sort of science is very important and when we talk of such science sir i am very much in, you know inclined to see some of the activities which our agriculture based industry take up even if you forget monsanto if you forget myco or you forget advanta or you forget syngenta a very interesting company i came across because i thought that i should share this uh, with the, uh, our youngsters because uh, professor bhattacharya excited me so much about uh, commercialization in agriculture and seeing agriculture as an entrepreneur i thought that uh, i should share some of these things for example uh, that company said that we should commercialize pollen and the name of that company if some of you are aware this power pollen is the name of that company what that company does it collects pollen it stores it and when needed they reapply it and create the uh, right type of uh, um, fruit like corn they first succeeded with corn and then with rice and so many other crops they are going so that the quality of produce is very very good i could I, i think once i saw long back i was reading about that company and i was so excited that company can think in a direction which at least we cannot think and they came up and it's a very good company which is working on this direction 100% agriculture based company second company i think is again a pheromone based company i think you must be aware of that company to control nematode they are using all pheromone based technology so now companies are thriving based on such technologies and we are still looking for uh, some jobs here and there i think it's high time and they are making good money it's not that uh, they are not making good money third company i saw very recently uh, indigo ag i think you must have seen that company and that company works on just microbes they and they are using all sorts of tool it's not that they are not using uh, they are using some uh, old style tool they are using things like uh, ai they predict that which microbe can boost the health of the plant and then they move accordingly so uh, to youngsters i think uh, what i can say if they are curious enough and if they know that what sort of problem we all are facing i think it's very easy and possible to develop your own entrepreneur and uh, professor bhattacharya very rightly said that it is time 
than when we go for entrepreneurship in agriculture and uh, at the back certainly very high end science is necessary whenever whatever you say whether it is a question of uh, a pheromone based science or uh, any other science i gave you only three examples i think if you go into literature it's full of science i remember sir uh, nowadays if you talk of anything in agriculture everybody say that we have to go for climate change scenario and there is uh, no escape from that we have to go for precision agriculture when the land is going down so newer methods of agriculture is a must an institute like nipb for example if they think of some variety which are very suitable for things like hydroponic and aeroponic they have to go for it i think in times to come we don't have any other alternative the way land is going down and down and down sir very recently uh, government of india has came up with a scheme on ocean and 1600 crores have been put aside for that ocean research i do not know <laughs> uh, although in icr we have institute on marine fisheries but on marine bio plant biotechnology how many people are working i i am not very sure and uh, uh, when government of india has put 1600 crores rupees only for this work i do not know whether institute like nipb will be having that sort of mandate or not but certainly in times to come in times to come when we talk of biofuels when we talk of non dignified tissues i think uh, ocean research may become almost imperative because land is only you know you have 70% ocean and uh, even if you just see even indian scenario where you have 7500 kilometers of uh, coast coastal region something could be done meaningfully and as professor bhattacharya said that time for agri entrepreneurship i think that could be something very very rewarding um, sir this year we witnessed a very interesting thing that we landed on the moon we are nearing the sun we are now moving around the sun and mars mission is on i am sure that i do not know but at least one part of our research can we also think little bit on space biology um, it may look that it may not be so relevant today but in time to come uh, the way our population is exploding the way land is going down these could be some better ways like for example in ocean research the people said that the most you know greatest advantage is if you can do cultivation under the sea you don't have to apply any pesticide insecticide nothing so much advantage is there so can we think of really launching a good program uh, around this uh, sir you might rec recall when we were at ihbt uh, you know we were all working on altitude so i think in one of the discussion um, sir was our chairman of our rc professor sapori was chairman of our rc and uh, we thought of working on uh, high altitude photosynthesis mechanism and uh, outcome was that we discovered one very interesting route by which plant can refix the carbon dioxide and nitrogen which is emitted during photorespiratory process while whole world was trying to convert c3 plant into c4 plant i think that that came out as a very very handy way to refix carbon and nitrogen so in c3 plant can also behave like a c4 plant so we put that mechanism into brassica it work very very well only thing is that um, ethical issues uh, come into play before you can do large scale field trial and when i heard that dr mahapatra sahab was talking of biotech based aicrp i think such project can really find some good place and uh, now nas has already tried to ensure that at least gene edited crops 
can go into the field i think it will be if we educate properly uh, our society about the benefit of transgenic crops about the i think sometimes uh, if we convince the people by data that then then probably it would be possible it will not be far off when we also are able to have transgenic crop like other countries maybe most of the canola oil that we are taking in this country might be transgenic <laughs> most of the brinjal that we are getting coming from bengal uh, we know that uh, it it is all uh, transgenic we already know it but still our regulation probably lack of knowledge could be one of the reason that uh, we are going into this direction and uh, uh, before i finish sir i remember uh, professor chopra all, all, always used to say you know the way we are doing science particularly in agriculture uh, it has to be relooked i think we used to have long discussions at times about how we should be doing science we were actually writing uh, one book together we edited actually one book together on uh, um, livelihood generation in himalayas and also one more book i was closely associated with him on uh, climate change in himalayas uh, technological interventions and uh, i noted one of his line uh, you know he said that how we should be behaving in agriculture uh, system and he says that although our farmers need real science that was his statement <laughs> because we, i used to note it down when he would say such a statement because we can never interpret his thoughts with our words i knew it very well he said that although our farmers need real science we are lost in semantics he said that farmers the only reality of india and the rest is show science is not about fighting the existing reality it is about building a new model a new method to deal with the reality that makes the existing model obsolete so he would always say do something new make the things obsolete so i was so fortunate that i had an opportunity to work very closely with him although i was not his direct student but i remember sir when i came to iri at that time in early 86 87 first time i saw professor chopra very well dressed personality and uh, he had come with naam hai chua and that was our first exposure to rflp i still remember that light green color brochure he had distributed to all of us about rflp and for the first time we learnt about rflp and we learnt because i was in plant physiology so molecular biology was just very new for us and that was my first exposure to professor chopra and that was so impressive uh, i mean and i think there after if you any time you meet him he will always be well dressed and the words that he would speak it was so selective he will never use extra word and the appropriateness of the word that he we would use it shows the clarity of the thoughts that he had and he always had lot of respect for his mother and uh, he always used to say that even on the last day of his mother um, she had her own bath and she had done the work with her own hand so he had lot of respect for her mother and the his family background you know his father was a principal and so on so it had lot of reflection so uh, it was so thoughtful to have the nipb lecture as professor will chopra lecture and we all are beneficiary of his company that's what i would say so our tribute to him and congratulations to all of you again for the day thank you so much Thank you so much sir for your inspiring words. Moving on to the another moment we are delighted to announce the release of NIPB insights. I request dignitaries to do the honors. So first one is 
uh, newsletter of NIPB for the year 2023. This is compiled by Dr. P.K. Mandal, Dr. Subodh Kumar Sinha, Dr. N.C. Gupta, Dr. Amita Mitra, Dr. Amol Kumar Solanki, Dr. Mahesh Rao, and Dr. Nimmi. Another one, we are proud to announce the release of Compendium of Technology and Product of NIPV for the benefit of end users. Compiled by Dr. Zazi Padaria, Dr. Monika Dalal, Dr. Subodh Kumar Sina and Dr. Mahesh Rao. The next is booklet of the publication of NIPV for the last five years. Compiled by Dr. Jazi Padaria, Dr. Monika Dalal, Dr. Subodh Kumar Sinha, and Dr. Mahesh Rao. Thank you so much, sir. Let's come to the special moment of the day. In recognition of outstanding contribution, we would like to felicitate a distinguished personality whose contributions have left an indelible mark on the legacy of ICR and IPB. Today, we have the privilege of recognizing the exemplary work of a True visionary, Dr. R. P. Sharma, sir, former director, NIPB. Before we proceed with the honor, let us take a moment to reflect on the illustrious journey of Dr. R. P. Sharma, sir, through a presentation video that encapsulates his remarkable contributions to the field, which continues to have tremendous application in science. May I request the AV team uh, to kindly play the video, please? January 2024, Foundation Day of ICAR, National Institute for Plant Biotechnology. On this occasion, we take immense pride and pleasure in felicitating Professor Rameshwar Prasad Sharma, only known as Dr. R.P. Sharma, its director of our beloved institute. Delighted to dedicate this day to the founders of science. We find it most appropriate to felicitate one such founder, Professor Sharma, for his pioneering work on wingless mutant of Drosophila and herbicide tolerance.
Children of Wingless Newton, but also a decade since the conception of the work on herbicide tolerant mutant Robin. Recording Professor stuff. Sharma worked with multiple systems, including Drosophila, the Cinderella of genetics, for his PhD under the Recording able and progress. visionary mentorship of Professor M. S. Swaminathan at IARI. The work on Drosophila at IARI was made possible due to prior interactions between Dr. V. L. Chopra and the stalwarts in the area. Charlotte Orbach, student of Dr. H. J. Muller from the famous Fly Lab. Additionally, through the establishment of Gamma Garden and IARI, the Professor Swaminathan marked the beginning of mutagenesis research. That was the time when the world was still reeling under the massive damage caused by mutagenesis. This galvanized the determination among scientists to use mutagens for beneficial acts. Following this, Professor Swaminathan was endeavoring to use irradiation of food items. So a gamma garden facility came up at IARI. If you want to understand a gene, you get said Professor H.J. Muller. This left a great impression on then young mind of Dr. Sharma. Thus, irradiation technique as well as EMS mutagenesis formed the base for his mutagenesis work. Celebrate and understand Professor Sharma's research, a background on cross anatomy and development of Drosophila, and insect as a model system if necessary. Can insect developmental biology experiments have a bearing on human biology? Evolution has never. The imaginal discs are specialized epithelial sheets specified in the embryo that grow and become patterned inside the larva. Thoracic imaginal precursors originate from a single embryonic segment from which wings and halteal, the dorsal appendages, form. The notable contributions of Professor Sharma were the identification of the homosexual mutant through X-ray irradiation experiments and wingless mutant through EMS mutagenesis. Professor Sharma in 1973 identified the first wingless mutant. When the wing or hot ear is absent in a wingless fly, the tissue is replaced by a mirror image duplication of the dorsal thorax, a region called the notum. The wingless mutation was recessive homozygous and viable. But there was a variable penetrance of winglessness. The homozygous wingless stock produced flies with no wing, one wing or two normal wings in roughly a 2 is to 2 is to 1 ratio. These flies also showed a variable loss of haltier. Mutant flies could have no haltier, one haltier or two normal haltiers in a manner completely independent of the wing status in the second thoracic segment. The wingless mutation was subsequently shown to result from a small deletion in the coding region. Later, it was established as a mutation of the enhancer element that drives expression, presumably this explains the penetrance of the wingless gene discovered by Professor Sharma. Notable was the year 1980 when Nelson, Wolhart and Wiskaus demonstrated wingless as a segment polarity mutant. Later, by genetic mosaic studies made possible by mitotic recombination, it was proved that wingless is not a homeotic mutation but a signaling transcription factor. End genes are essential for retroposon integration in the host genome and showed homology with winglet. Hence, the nomenclature of winglet leads to wind integrating int gene with winglet. Interestingly, many of the signaling pathways and patterning genes identified and characterized in Drosophila have comparable functions during vertebrate appendage development. All vertebrates have wind gene family with multiple members. In humans, there are 19 wind genes. These are implicated in almost all organ development and multiple mechanisms including cell phase determination, cell proliferation, cell migration, cell polarity and cell death. Wind is now central to cancer biology, cardiac ailments including heart attack and regeneration potential of the tissue. At the same time, it is this enormous regeneration potential that leads to cancer. Today, wind gene family finds associations in regenerative medicine, such as regenerating the lost neurons and sinoatrial nodes, more commonly known as SAN or pacemaker. Thus, 
a basic developmental genetics work carried out thoroughly has come a long way from morphogenesis to metastasis to tissue regeneration once a scientist always a scientist professor rp sharma's illustrious career is an apt example of this when right genome sequencing project the first international genome sequencing project of icar as well as a country culminated in 2005 the next logical way forward was to get into functional genomics of right professor rp sharma urged dr mahapatra then serving at our institute who eventually became secretary there and dg icar to initiate a program on ems mutagenesis of right and establish a national repository of right mutants this program was funded by dbt in two phases from 2007 to 2013 and from 2015 to 2021 interestingly the possibility of developing a herbicide tolerant mutant in rice was mooted by professor sharma over the dinner table during a project review meeting late dr robin the then head of the rice department at tnau executed this idea beautifully and lo behold we had an ht mutant tnau iari and nipb joined their hands and characterized the mutant and subsequently transferred the herbicide tolerant trait to variety so far two varieties from iari and one from nrri have been released while many more are on pipeline at tnau iari nrri uas bengaluru and iirr partners from the mutant mm-hmm. project mm-hmm. formulated mm-hmm. by professor mm-hmm. sharma mm-hmm. way back in 2007 mm-hmm. professor sharma mm-hmm. is also a teacher mm-hmm. par excellence mm-hmm. he used mm-hmm. drosophila stock in population to conduct practical classes he retired as the director of nipb erstwhile nrcpb and has served in multiple national and foreign assignments till date he has been a voracious reader with astounding clarity of thought and idea more importantly his sight on application into agriculture never wavers it is our privilege to know him to be associated with him and to indulge in scientific brainstorming session this is a small tribute to a great scientific mind a man of great acumen we thank the almighty for providing us with an opportunity to felicitate him for his glorious achievement on the identification of the first wingless mutant which later fetched a nobel prize in the year 1995 um, now it's my pleasure and uh, i feel blessed to have this opportunity to brief the citation that highlights the milestone and achievements of dr sharma sir uh, that make uh, Uh, there is an inspiration for all of us this citation is awarded to dr rameshwar prasad sharma commemorating his historic discovery of the wingless mutant in drosophila and its subsequent genetic characterization in the year 1973 the wingless gene has far reaching implications in the areas of developmental biology cancer biology and tissue regeneration paying the way for the treatment of heart ailment neurodegenerative disorders and uh, cancer this citation also greatly acknowledges dr sharma's brainchild the herbicide tolerant mutant robin developed through ems induced mutagenesis of rice cultivar nagina 22 this work is expected to revolutionize rice cultivation in the country propelling it towards direct seeded rice now as a symbol of our deepest respect and gratitude we would like to decorate dr r p sharma sir with a citation award and shawl may i request dr sanjay kumar sir chairman srb to do the honors kindly Now I request the honorary Dr. R. P. Sharma sir 
to share his thoughts and reflections on the momentous occasion. Good morning, everyone. Before I start, I would like to thank all of you for your presence. <coughs> Chairman of today, Dr. Sanjay Kumar, Dr. Bhattacharya Ji, Dr. Mahapatra, Dr. T.R. Sharma, Dr. Yadav, Dr. Ramchar Bhattacharya, I have in the front row all my colleagues uh, with whom I have grown in the system. We have Dr. Grover, Dr. Sapodi, Dr. Kondal, Dr. Singh, and then uh, Vishnathan and uh, Pradarya. And the, uh, the, which reminds me always about Dr. Swaminathan Vaisadi. I see many uh, with whom I have worked. I see uh, Srinivasan and all my colleagues from the from the centers. They have few old now left, most of them on the Rimu names. And uh, I would like to thank all of you first for bestowing me with this honor. And before I conclude or give my own uh, views, I am like to put out record some of the people with whom I interacted and who have been great source of inspiration and help to me in my research work. My guide, Dr. M. Swaminathan, which all of you know, a great teacher. I don't, I don't see very old people here around who might have attended his class. It used to attract uh, like a honeybee's comb. Everyone, if you go in the morning, evening, you will find his lecture rooms are always full, overflowing. That was the kind of attraction. He never missed his class. Would be early morning. He might have uh, during the daytime any amount of work, but in the morning he will take the class and then he will attend to other activities. He was the person. Those, we were in those days in the cycle age. All of us were cycle. There, in this institute, there were only two courts. One was in anthropology by Dr. Prasada, who had returned from uh, England and had brought that heritage car with him, which we call heritage now. And the other one, a blue ambassador of Dr. Swabilathar, which was mostly used by his wife, because she was a ordinary teacher in St. Thomas. So uh, it was basically a cycle age, everyone, he will take breakfast at 8 o'clock, will go into the botany fields and he knew everyone by name, he will interact with them, he will say any difficulty, if you are really having any difficulty, that was the place where you can tell and you be rest assured that it will be taken care of. So, a great teacher, great scientist, more you talk, any adjective you use, the adjective is all short. And that's the kind of personality that Swaminathan was. Eighteen Natajaran, many people here would not know, Eighteen Natajaran was his first PhD student. At that time, PG school was not existing. It, uh, he did his PhD and, uh, with Swaminathan and submitted to Delhi University, so his degree is from Delhi University. When, uh, a great scientist, he moved from here in 1965 to Stockholm and from there to Leiden and his work on fragile X chrome syndrome in humans is, is very well documented. I don't have to uh, really especially talk about Professor B. L. Chopra. All of us have uh, known him so closely. Sentiments have been expressed. But for me, he was a teacher, not in a formal sense, but day-to-day -day teacher. Can you believe it? We spend in this institute 60 years together. I joined this institute in 1962 
and he expired unfortunately in 19, 2020. That was the period which we were almost every day together. No holidays, no Sundays. Sunday afternoons only for personal work or family work. One morning will be this. Not many people would know he used to stay in model town in next cycle age. He used to be the first to report in the institute and he used to be the last to go from the institute. That's the kind of attachment and that's the kind of uh, dedication uh, he had. We have taken lunch together for more than 35 years or 40 years. He was an uh, extremely good cook, if, if I can uh, say that. Cooked, which I don't eat, cooked uh, um, chicken and uh, mutton is much better, which is not mine, but then the general cook. He enjoyed cooking. Many of our friends from all over the world who used to come to visit to us, we never used to go to hotels. He used to cook and bring it in our lunch club and that used to be the, uh, uh, the kind of uh, entertainment which we used to provide to our guests and that was very, everyone liked that. I like to put on records Dr. Thilachan Mahapatra was my student, my colleague and a dear friend. In fact, this felicitation program is his brainchild. When I was talking, he, he read, he understood the significance of wingless mutants. It's being used almost in all the labs around in the world who are working on cancer. It's being used by all the people who are working on developmental biology. And, that's, and soon you are going to have a number of drugs in the market for the treatment of various ailments by, by dealing with the wind signaling pathway. That's the kind of attraction this particular uh, mutant has attained all over the world. In India, unfortunately, uh, it came from the agriculture sector, so many people do not really know. It also, our medical people are more of clinicians, not the researchers, and therefore, the very few people of, uh, in, the, in the country, they are utilizing this mutant. But if you see around the world, I was in Australia a few years earlier, and I asked a, a lady presented his, her work on mint uh, signaling pathway. I asked her uh, from where to originate it. She didn't know when I told them that it is a combination of W is coming from wingless, which we discovered, and ANT is coming from int, a gene responsible for memory tumor. So since it started showing homology to um, uh, cancer, the name was changed from wingless to wind. But if those who are working in developmental biology, they still use it as wingless. Those who are working in cancer, they use wind. But if you put, if you put on a Google, Google, just put wind and put the human body part, you will find the latest publications coming. Thousands of thousands of the publications now, which I go on uh, seeing them, which are coming, all of you are interested to know the letters, just sit on your Google, uh, right wind signaling, or just put wind, and the uh, disease in which you are interested, and you will find this particular gene signaling is almost involved everywhere. Because this is the gene which basically is involved in segment uh, and polarity. All our body is segmented. All the, seg all the animal bodies are segmented. So any gene which is involved in segmentation is this gene. So this is a very primary gene which uh, decides the segmentation. Each of one of us, each of our cell is polar. We have proximal, distal, we have dorsal, ventral. These are the informations which are decided again by the genes. And this particular signal is involved there. If you see, the, the, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I have prepared something for, for the talk today, but since many things are covered and the time is, uh, is short, so I'm not going to into the details, but I, I find that this particular gene, and I will come Richard back to it later, I would connect myself, this is the old age problem. You have three R's, reading, retention, and recalling. When you recall, and with old age, they are 
those um, uh, th those gaps. So I missed it between some uh, some pages, but I will return back to it. IRI for me has been a bakka. I joined this. I very much feel I basically was born here. I joined this in 1962, and uh, this was a. I'm coming from a farming family, and joining IRI for me was a blessing. I have seen during the uh, during my stay here the transformation which is in agriculture which has gone. We uh, and the, the role agricultural scientists have played in it. I wish to witness the establishment of PG school in IRI, and later on our students are moving around. And, uh, and and uh, supporting the development of agricultural education in whole country. In fact, that was the time you will see our students almost everywhere, professors, directors, vice chancellors. Very satisfying kind of thing, and the contribution of IRI in the human resource development. Uh, I have also seen the things which are in agricultural transformation which were taking place. For example, many people would know Jonti village in Haryana. The, the, the concept, the seed concept, which Dr. Seed, uh, which Dr. Swamidasan floated. When we started developing seed, the seed we produce demand, NSC came in. When we started producing seed enough and producing enough food, food cooperation came in. So these are the sequence. Of events which took place and which ultimately culminated into green revolution. This all we have seen the way it was happening. When I joined Dr. Swamidasan's group, it was very well established in and known internationally in the area of innovation. He also was at the time very keen to use radiation for the food preservation. And before he established the Gavang Garden, which was referred to, I don't know if many of you know the NSC complex which we have here. You should be Gavang Garden. The sort you, you irradiate. I, is anyone has seen Gavang Garden? I think maybe uh, Dr. Kordal might have seen. Afterwards, Gavang Garden was replaced with Gavang Cell, and now Bark Trombe. A full-fledged food radiation preservation uh, facility. FDA of USA has already recommended quite a few foods which can be preserved by radiation. So that was the initially it was basically started here. When it was started, then the Dosafla lab was established because Dr. Sarvendra wanted to test the wholesomeness of the food. He was doing on plants; it can be easy, but plants can be related with. Uh, human beings on the food, and therefore the Dosafla lab came into being. Very interesting stories, uh, not the time, but we established the Dosafla lab. Dosafla requires 25 degrees temperature. The, the lab, which was put on the electric supply those days, the, these uh, heritage buildings, they have the kind of electric. Supply, which could not withstand at those days the air, air conditioners. This is this was one problem. Those days electricity also in Delhi there were frequent load shedings. So therefore it was very difficult for us to maintain those villas. In summer we used to buy uh, ice cubes from the sent from the market and then put in the test tube in the uh, trays and then maintain the supplies. So that's how. But winter was okay. In winter, most of the work was was done in winter. But that's how Dosafila lab came in, and we sustained this. From there, through investigations, we went into the philosophy of Professor A. J. Muller that if you want to know a gene, mutate it, and that has been our motto. That's how we have been following all through in our in our in our approach. We have. Uh,
most of the earlier studies in that Charles has group but mostly methodology oriented, which are the to decide the docility, etc. Then I was started thinking that that Muller's hypothesis that if you want to mutate it, if you want to understand a gene, mutate it. I then at the time I came across a biography of Dr. Benzer. Benzer has already established himself and all of you in strength of genetics or microbiology who know the autolocus of gene. Autolocus was fully uh, analyzed by Samuel Benzer, came out with the uh, names of cistrone, mutone and recone. And then afterwards he suddenly started thinking what to go, where to go further because he already had crossed the limit. You cannot tell go then signal based change which is a mutual. And then he shifted. These are the kind of intuitive minds. They don't sit idle. The moment he realized that it is the love a block, they shifted, he went into behavioral genetics. And Dosophila was the best system for Now uh, to give you a glimpse of it. And I think these are the kind of minds when I was talking to uh, Edgy Khurana. After Bolkura's the, the gene synthesis, these are the kind of people who start thinking, they can never think either. They went into babbling uh, uh, And uh, I'm happy to see uh, Dr. Bhattacharya have worked with Dr. Khurana on rhodopsin. Rhodopsin in our retina, how rhodopsin works. That's where they have, he had gone. Uh, later on after, after Bolkro biology. Similarly, Benzer, basically a physicist by training, converted himself to Bolkro biology and from there converted himself to behavioral genetics. I know that many of you would know this Benzer who had given the name neurogenetics, what we now uh, understand as behavioral genetics with, uh, neurogenetics. The kind of mutants which had isolated vision, this is not dosophila, locomotion, sexual function, nerves and muscles functions, learning and memory, circadianism, dietary restrictions and longevity. This this paper I saw, which is the, which was his the which appeared after his death. But till that time, these are the kind of people which would be really getting inspirations. Must think diversely. Must always be uh, uh, the thinkers. Dietary restriction and longevity. That's fantastic. Because we know now when we talk about food nutrition, etc. And we relate it to uh, human beings. That's where these are, you know, things. Working on Dosophila. Rosmas uh, worked with Benzer, he but and got Nobel Prize along with Young and Jeffrey Hall in 2007 for circadian rhythm gene isolation. So those are the kinds of things which, you, when you go through, you find that there's no limit. There's no limit. The limit is only in your thinking. You can always think. You can always think big and you start planning. You have this genetic system available or develop the genetic system yourself, which what people do. Better than develop what I was, when I was reading, I read somewhere counter current distribution. Basically, in the training, a physicist can think in both lines. Counter current distribution. When I read it, I found these are the two plastic uh, strips with some holes and some glass tubes, so you can attach them. And take the advantage of phototactic behavior of Dosophila. Most of the insects, they get attracted towards light. So you, you put the insect in one tube, put the uh, uh, source of light, this move, the flies will move to that tube, shift it, they, they will be separating. So you will separate the flies into those who are positive phototactic, which are negative phototactic. So, and from there you can deduce then, you can learn many things. Has a fly learned to go towards light or is that going to I actually think the mutant in that, I be call it sluggish. 
it's very interesting mutant. When you uh, uh, put this particular mutant, it doesn't go towards light. Sluggish. Movement is very slow. But the moment you put those males together, the males will start following males. And that's what I published in the experience here. It's a homosexual mutant. That would mean that the flies, which were generally are what we have learned today, but uh, you have seen the pheromones, the males are attracted towards the pheromones in the female releases. In this particular case, what might be happening is that males are attracted to another male because the neuronic connection, the, light, the neurons which were to go to the, uh, to the uh, phototactic uh, place go now to the brain which is involved in sexual recognition. And this, uh, uh, this particular mutant was very, very interesting. Unfortunately, this, this was a single gene, but it was between a translocation between X and third chromosome. And therefore, when you maintain them, you will always find the normal males with very small frequency coming. So if you are little uh, uh, careless in maintaining, those normal males will take over. And that has happened. The message from this, if you have, uh, if you have a good material coming with you, if you, whatever addresses you can do, do it. Otherwise, give it to someone who is involved in other kind of studies. Otherwise, genetic material once you produce is very difficult. Of we change our interest, we change our location, and therefore, many times the material which you develop gets lost. And that was otherwise. By now, if I had that, I had given this. I had liquid, liquid obesity, who ultimately was working on neuronic uh, connections uh, in that. But somehow we didn't metalize. Otherwise, we could have demonstrated that the the cells in the retina involved in photoreception, how they are connected through the neuron into our brain. Most probably in this particular case, the wrong connections, the neurons are going into the area which is recognized as sexual uh, preference. I will, I can go on giving the number of interesting mutants on cell polarity and all that, but I think this time the time and uh, what I will uh, uh, go and, and uh, uh, highlight that the virus which we had isolated is a is omnipresent in all the animal system, which are segmented. You cannot have an animal if uh, if there is no segmentation uh, gene involved. This has to be. Signal transmission, wind signal transmission has to be has to be there. Otherwise, there will be if it is malfunctioning, either it will lead to aberrations later on, or it will lead to still birth. Uh, the embryos. I expect. Uh, I will not talk more about the scientists because you people have already known. But I will just talk one which Dr. Bhapatra has also referred to, and which. You people, all young people in this institute are sitting on a gold mine. We have developed, and why I am telling you gold mine, we have developed this material in a more than, a, besides the herbicide tolerant which has been referred to, we have developed uh, more than 80,000 M2 plants. You know, when uh, Dr. Akhlek Stagge and myself were attending a conference uh, called by Sasaki during the uh, uh, rice germ sequencing program. Then I saw that two, three uh, group of people from different parts of the world who had already started thinking about functional genomics. Structural genomics by, by sequencing you can do, but for functional genomics you need the phenotypes, you need the mutants. People were uh, isolating mutants and therefore that's why when I came back and I requested Dr. Mahapatha, he was very kind enough. We assembled a group of uh, young people around, Mahapata from IRI, there A.K. Singh from uh, IRI, Amita uh, from IRI, then we had Robin from TNAU, we had Satya from U.S. Bangalore, we had Puldeep Singh from PAU, and Dr. Sarla from DRR, Hyderabad. Got collected together, N.K. Singh is sitting here, who joined with us, and plan ourselves to isolate mutants. 
we succeeded and credit for this goes to Robin and I am telling you to the students how we could succeed. Twenty, about um, uh, 80,000 mutants, about 5 acres of land, all the mutants are to be seasonally harvested. I asked him, uh, he offered his services for the land and other things, but then what about the labor etc. That was, why can't we use our students? That free, pay them. Labor you could add because they will not. So our students, were, I think, is there anyone from TNU of, of, of that time area? No. I know the, the, the graduate students of TNU, they helped. We uh, imply all of them. After their class, they will choose to spend one or two hours. Individual heart plant, plant will be harvested and bulked. All those more than 80,000 bulk mutants are available now with us. They are available at three places. They are available at NIPB, they are available at TNAU, they are also available at CRRI Katak. So the idea, whole idea was that anyone, if you want to have some uh, uh, brain right, brain wave, come up with new ideas and you do the genetic variability search. If you have some uh, for certain traits already identified a screening method, Select. In other words, the more phenotype screening you will do, the more genes you will discover, more new novel pathways you will discover. And that's the idea of uh, starting that, that culture. My uh, suggestion would be that uh, the young people, those who are just entering and they have some brain wave, they want to do something, they can request the director and NIPB or in TNAU or uh, CRRI to give the material you can screen the genotypes in which we are interested and start with the process. You don't have to invest two, three years or four years for generating the material. The material is has already been generated. All this I did with the help of this group. I was already retired at the time, but I thought uh, uh, this is the kind of contribution which you can certainly do for posterity. So I, uh, I would like to uh, conclude that uh, there are quite a, bit, quite a bit to talk on various particular aspects. Two things I can say. I am seeing, uh, Dr. Bhattacharya, I am seeing uh, quite a bit of future of which uh, and thin signaling in insect pest management because they are the segmented material. Already, already I, I have noted some, I will not talk now, but if you go into the literature, put on Google with insect pest management and you will find quite a few publications which are already working. So in the country, I think this is the time now since you are in the innovation stages here, look for chemicals which can disturb the wind signally and then see its impact on insect pests. So this is because this is already in the literature, already now coming, so something which I'm not telling, something new, which already in the, uh, in the world, people have already started looking at it. I'm also uh, uh, interested in the ICR, the uh, veterinary science. Most of the diseases in human beings and animals are common. Insect, animal science also must look into the application of wind cigarette. Human means generally the veterinary scientists they follow the human uh, development. Most of the drugs which are going to develop for human elements are ultimately going to percolate into uh, veterinary sciences, but they can start their own uh, looking for new, new pathways. When I was looking about the uh, the uh, uh, the mutants in in in, in, the, in rice, my immediate uh, reaction is that it could be look for yield, and if you were to look, what are the parameters which are inhibiting, which are interfering with yield? Is it the, in plant brain, those of you who are working, there is a huge amount of negative interactions, negative influence. 
as you break the negative inserts. For example, if you want to increase the grain yield, grain number, grain weight, the moment you increase grain weight, grain number will go down. The moment you increase the grain number, grain weight will go down. These are negatively correlated characters. So can we look for the genetic variability within this stock where you can certainly, our parameters are doing this, are breaking this negative correlation, but slowly. Because that's what they can do. But can we, can we, uh, can we, uh, okay, okay, yeah, I, I forgot. Can we uh, screen these kinds of uh, uh, material for the, for those traits? And you now there is a, uh, our, uh, I can discuss it later, maybe we can organize a meeting in our IPBG and, IPB and have a greater discussion. But there is a message here, Dr. Shantanu has to leave for North uh, Tripathi, which is his flight. And therefore, I would like to thank all of you. I would like to thank NIV for, uh, for the honor which you have bestowed on me. I would like to thank all of you for your presence. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Uh, once again, thank you, sir, for your invaluable contributions for, and for gracing us with your presence today. Uh, in the same spirit, uh, let us express our heartfelt felicitation to Professor Shantanu Bhattacharya, sir, Director, Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research, Tirupati. For this, I request Director NIPB, Dr. R.C. Bhattacharya, sir, to present the token of love. We feel privileged to have you here, sir, and listen to you. Thank you for sharing your invaluable knowledge with us. Now, we are honored to felicitate Dr. Sanjay Kumar, sir, Chairman Agricultural Scientist Recruitment Board. Please accept our sincere appreciation, sir. Now, turning our attention to our guide and well-wisher, Dr. T. R. Sharma, sir, your dedication and leadership We are honored to uh, felicitate Dr. T. Mahapatra, sir, chairperson of PPVFRA. Thank you, sir. Uh, we, we always look forward to your guidance and blessings, sir. We, have, we are honored to felicitate Dr. T. R. Sharma, sir, uh, Deputy Director General, ICR. We are excited to felicitate uh, Dr. D. K. Adava, sir, Assistant Director General, ICR. Thank you so much, sir. Before we proceed further, there is one more individual whose contribution we would like to acknowledge and appreciate. At this juncture, I would like to invite Ms. Janvi Ramesh Shetty, the daughter of Dr. Amita, to kindly join us on the stage. Her invaluable contribution to the preparation of the presentation dedicated to Dr. R.P. Sharma, sir, deserves special recognition. I request Bhattacharya, sir, to present a token of appreciation to Ms. Janvi.
थैंक यू जानवी फॉर योर एक्सेप्शनल एफर्ट वी आर ट्रूली ऑनर टू हॉल हैव यू ऑल विद अस टुडे थैंक यू ऑल फॉर योर अनवेवरिंग डेडिकेशन फॉर दिस प्रोग्राम सो बिफोर वी कंक्लूड लेट अस एक्सप्रेस अ सिंसियर थैंक्स टू वन एंड ऑल हु हैव मेड दिस डे ट्रूली स्पेशल नाउ आई रिक्वेस्ट डॉक्टर पी के जैन सर टू प्रपोज द फॉर्मल वॉट ऑफ थैंक्स हाँ जी सर गुड आफ्टरनून टू ऑल आई हैव बीन गिवन अ वेरी प्लेजेंट ड्यूटी टू प्रपोज वोट ऑफ थैंक्स आई एम सॉरी फॉर कमिंग बिटवीन यू एंड लंच बट द लिस्ट इज लॉन्ग प्लीज बियर विद मी एट द आउटसेट फॉन मेमोरीज ऑफ प्रोफेसर रियल चोपड़ा कम टू माई माइंड एन आई पी बी इज ब्रेन चाइल्ड हैज रीच दिस स्टेज नाउ प्राइमरली ड्यू टू हिज विजन एंड गाइडेंस ऑल थ्रू द लास्ट थर्टी फाइव ईयर्स ऑफ सो एज अ रिसर्चर एंड एडमिनिस्ट्रेटर फॉर एक्सलेंस he was so much involved in the research and development program of the institute that despite superannuating long back he was always an integral part of us he was torch bearer guiding us to move forward and taking care that we do not stumble on the way we do we do miss him professor veel chopra's daughter miss vishali she is with us and we are indeed so grateful to her to make it today's event i thank you i am thankful to professor rp sharma sir former director nipb erswell nrcpb for agreeing to our request and sharing his thoughts and sharing his blessings to the nipb family on this occasion indeed it's a matter of pride for all of us to listen to the discovery which was carried 50 years back and we are reaping rich dividends now so we are proud of you as one of the founding members of nipb and we salute your dedication and passion for the science a profound thanks to the speaker of the day professor santu bhattacharya director i sir for such an illuminating talk he readily agreed to be a part of this celebration and took out time from his immensely busy schedule and the pheromone sensor and the femtogram femtogram based detection it is indeed very novel and maybe this all will set the tone for future collaborations between icer and icr it's a matter of pride for us to have dr sanjay kumar chairman srb with us this morning he has been a phd student of iri and so we are indeed thankful to you from the core of our hearts that you could spare valuable time of yours to be with us grace the occasion and advise and guide us i am highly thankful to dr timha patra sir chairperson ppva and fra for his insightful insightful comments and tracing the journey of nipb right from its inception no other person could have fit that sir we are thankful to you i am highly thankful to dr t r sharma sir deputy director general crop science for sparing his time NIPB has been his karam bhumi for nearly 20 years and he is a role model for all of us sir as a scientist and then as director of NIPB you have left an indelible mark on all of us and your motto of striving for excellence will be the guiding light for us in the years to come we idolize you and assure you that we'll do our best and live up to the high standards set by you i am highly thankful to dr dk yadav sir adg seed for being there with us we look forward to his advice in all the matters and his patience and calm behavior sets everything right we'll continue to work under your able guidance sir special mention to our director general dr himanshu patak he would have been with us but for an important meeting and it is under his blessings and encouragement we have conducted this program and he always strives for perfection and give the best to the system without being stressed thanks are due to dr ak singh director iri for sharing the resources at the pusa campus and readily agreeing to let us use this auditorium for today's function we always look forward to his guidance i am thankful to all the dignitaries professor sudhi sapori former vice chancellor jnu dr anil grover my teacher from delhi university dr kr kondal sir dr shrinivasan sir professor nk singh i am specially thankful to the joint directors dr vishwanathan dr padaria dr brahmanand HODs professors of IRI distinguished guests who have come all the way and spared their time to join us because of their love and affection for this institute indeed we are overwhelmed by this gesture and believe that they will continue to share their affection like this i am thankful to dr rc bhattacharya director nipb for the dedicated efforts for the foundation day celebration though he gave the freedom to operate he was very much involved in all the efforts and activities for the celebration of the foundation day his quest for perfection motivated all of us to give our best and go ahead with full energy thanks are due to all the scientific technical and administrative staff of npb who have worked like a cohesive team 
and taken care that all the activities related to the celebration are finished well in time and are executed nicely. We had a number of committees for the conduct of the program. The hall management committee doctor, headed by Dr. Mandel and team, reception committee headed by Dr. Jasdeep and her team, food committee taken care by Dr. Kishore and his team, logistics committee being taken care by Dr. Anil Singh and the team, invitation committee by Dr. Amul Salanke, media publicity committee by Dr. Subhu Sena. And I am highly thankful to Dr. Amita for the excellent video which she has prepared and special mention for Ms. Janvi who has given her voice to the presentation. An excellent comparing by the youngest scientist of our institute, Dr. Shabana, who worked relentlessly and coordinated with all involved in this function. Special words for the administrative and finance team headed by Mr. Sumit Singh SAO and Mr. Rahul SFAO. I thank all the staff, students, undergraduate and postgraduate, the project staff including young professionals, GRF, SRFs and RAs, and the contractual staff who have been the backbone of research and teaching at our institute. Without their commitments and support, it would not have been possible to organize this program. Please excuse me if I have forgotten to name someone. Happy Maka Sakranti to all of you. I thank one and all. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Finally, I would like to invite everyone to join us for a group photograph outside. And afterward, please proceed to the lawn for a delightful lunch and visit the stalls. Before that, I kindly request everyone to rise for the national anthem. Janagana mana adhinayaka jayahe Bharat bhagya vidhata Punjab, Sindh, Gujarat, Maratha Dravida, Uttkala, Vanga Vindya, Himachala, Yamuna, Ganga Uchala, Jaladhi, Taranga Tava Shubha Name Jage Tava Shubha Aashish Maage Gahe Tava Jaya Gatha Jana Gana Mangala Dayak Jaya He Bharat Bhagya Vidhata Jaya He Jaya He Jaya He Jaya 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 He Thank you all once again for gracing us with your presence and making this Foundation Day celebration a memorable one. Namaste.